All right. Um, so thank you all uh, for having me today, and Jim, for inviting me. Being up here is just as exciting as hearing uh, Microsoft say they love Linux. Um, so it's, uh, it's exciting for us to be able to share this stuff. Um, here's the plan. I'm going to give you a quick rundown of what CoreOS is and why we built it. And I'm going to stop there and start talking about other people's products uh, and tell you how a number of companies are using containers, using um, distributed systems, and how we're commercializing open source and kind of a, a, a bunch of different things related to all that. So that's the plan. Here we go. All right. So I'm Alex Polvey. Quick background. I was previously at Rackspace uh, hosting, which I joined through the acquisition of my first company called CloudKick. Uh, we provided cloud server monitoring management tools. And before that, I was at the uh, early employee at the Mozilla Foundation, kind of in the Firefox 1.0 days. Um, like Jim, I have raised some funding for helping secure the internet and creating a service that has the word core in it. <laughs> um, um, you know, uh, different type of name brands. These are our venture capitalists, um, and you know, they're funding the open source development uh, that, that we are currently doing. Um, Greg Crow Hartman, who is a Lynx Foundation staff member, has been an early kind of contributor to our project and advisor for us. Um, and then our team is really a, a set of folks that have been building these types of distributed systems um, at you know, Twitter, Google, SUSE, and all, all, the, all the major folks that have been doing this in the past. So we, we've really assembled a, a top group of folks to think about these issues. So why does a, a uh, Series A funded startup in 2014, 2015 start building a new Linux distribution? Um, and, and that's what CoreOS is. CoreOS is, a, is a, uh, a lightweight Linux OS. I'll get into why we built it in a minute. Our other open source projects that we have created uh, more recently are Rocket and etcd. Uh, we have separate talks going on about this during, um, during this, this summit, if you're interested in that stuff. Uh, but today, we're focusing mainly on CoreOS and why we built it. So CoreOS is a Linux distribution uh, meant for these large server deployments. Um, so we, when we set out to build CoreOS, uh, we asked ourselves, you know, what is something that we could do that we have an advantage on to, to help fundamentally improve the security of the internet? Again, I want to thank Jim for setting us up so well for this. Um, and and, uh, and our, our approach here was like, look, let's change the way server infrastructure is ran. Uh, we know what we need to do. We've seen it happen at these, these bigger deployments. Um, but, but we need to make these tools and sort of methods of running server infrastructure more accessible to companies you know, that aren't Google and Facebook, kind of everybody else. So the way that, that we're, we're doing this is it's part the way we bundle and run applications using containers. It's part um, how we use distributed dis systems as sort of a primitive in running infrastructure. Uh, and then on the security side, it's about how we apply updates and think about updates. And that's the piece I wanted to touch on right now. So who here remembers in like 2002-ish when Internet Explorer was 99% market share? There was these patch Tuesdays um, and this stream of vulnerabilities that kind of inflicted a very unsafe front-end internet. You guys remember that? It was, it was a weird time. Every, when these patches came out, every IT department around the world would scramble and be like, oh, we got to apply these patches um, to our servers. Um, and and, and you know, we got to fix this as soon as we can. This is what uh, led Firefox to emerge. Firefox came out at the same time. It was a lightweight, more secure browser. Uh, you know, mantra was take back the web. Um, you know, provide sort of open standards as well as, as a more secure alternative on the internet. Um, when Chrome came out shortly thereafter, they did something subtle but distinctly different around the way that, that patches are handled, and that's around automatic updates. And, and what Chrome did differently um, than, than IE and Microsoft and Firefox was doing at the time uh, was automatically download and apply the patch. So before you had IE and Firefox that made the patch available, you, would, you could tell, uh, you know, the, these ops departments would be like, okay, there's a new patch, we need to now roll it out to our infrastructure. Chrome and Google was like, hey, look, we can centrally manage this better than any individual IT team can, so let's, let's just download and apply it. Now, there are some civil liberties issues here around sort of software changing out from under you, um, but if you, if you give trust uh, to the software vendor to be able to do this for you, then, then they can manage the security better. And when, when Firefox and IE followed suit in this, which they do today, I believe just the ability to apply patches was the biggest step function in front-end internet security that we've ever seen. Now, now, the web is a pretty safe place, and as a side effect, these guys can also you know, go and 
upgrade the internet overnight. We have HTML5, and I would argue that it's because these guys can go and roll out patches. We're about to feel it with HTTP2. That, that kind of got finalized yesterday, and you know, over the course of the next one to two years, our browsers will light up with, with HTTP2 support, the web server infrastructure behind it will slowly start iterating, and that protocol will become usable on the web. We'll upgrade the internet. So on servers, we have nothing like this at all in automatic updates. In fact, on a server, the mantra is, is get it running and don't touch it. Uh, server infrastructure is so fragile that sort of changing things is a, is, you know, is a very scary idea. And so we thought, hey, this is a perfect thing for a startup to work on. It's so orthogonal to the way that people run infrastructure today that if we can automatically patch a server, one, we're going to freak out all these IT guys. So a, a big company isn't, you know, one of these existing vendors isn't going to dramatically change their model to be this way. But if it works, it unlocks a lot of value. You know, and that value is around performance, reliability, and security, namely everything you get by, um, by running the latest version of software. And so our very first release that we shipped of CoreOS was a lightweight Linux OS that automatically updates itself. We stuck an updater in it. Um, and and since, since we've released um, CoreOS, first I wanted to call out, uh, you know, Jim again used these exact same logos. This was uncoordinated. Um, but we live in a time where vulnerabilities get branding. <laughs> Isn't that kind of crazy? I mean, there's such like a no thing that we branded vulnerabilities. It's like, yeah, heart bleed shirts and, Anyway, so since, um, since these vulnerabilities and a number of the other ones that were mentioned earlier have come out, CoreOS has been around, and our system is working. Uh, we, we download and apply patches and push that server infrastructure to, to the latest version without any user intervention on that. So you know, we have a team of guys that are maintaining the distro, and when the vulnerability is released, they scramble. They're, they're acting as that, that IT department, but for all of our folks using CoreOS on Amazon and Google and bare metal and virtual machines on their desktop, and we patch and update them you know, for them automatically. Um, and for our sliver of the internet, it is fixed. <laughs> um, and we think that this model is really the only model that will work going forward, and we've seen it be adopted you know, already. Like, we're not inventing this. We've seen it be adopted by the mobile guys with over-the-air updates, this, um, you know, the desktop guys, Chrome OS we, is a lot of of what this is inspired from, um, but even Apple very recently shipped a, an automatic patch this way. I, I don't know if any of the Mac users out there, but there, about a month ago, you got a little alert that says, a security update's been automatically applied. Huh, <laughs> Apple just did something um, very, very similar as well. And I believe that this is the only way to, to actually fix these issues sort of that are, that's future-proof. Okay, so how do you build a Linux OS that automatically updates itself? The first step outside of sticking an updater in it is you have to separate application dependencies from the host dependencies. Because what, what, breaks, um, what breaks most of the time when you deploy a patch is you update your version of OpenSSL and then your web server doesn't work, um, but your database is working fine or, or something like that. So you have to repackage your applications to contain all the dependencies that are required for them to run so that you can individually build and test and verify that those things are working as, as disparate units. And that's what led us to containers. Containers are very natural technology for this. Um, and, and we shipped CoreOS as a container native OS, meaning the only way you can run applications inside of, of CoreOS is using a container. Now, in the past, this is where the CoreOS pitch stops. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the past, let's see, 18 months, containers, primarily because of Docker, has become a, a you know, quite a discussion point uh, and something that is kind of rolling around infrastructure. And so what I wanted to do was talk about a number of different projects that are underway um, and through different companies and, and just speak to, one, what does that project do? Two, how are they using containers um, with this? And then three, what is the commercialization of this? Because all of these are our vendors at the end of the day that are trying to make money both with containers, distributed systems, um, and open source, ourselves included. Um, and so this is where I pivot from CoreOS to talking about all these different, all these different projects. Sound good? All right. First one. Um, oh, I, I want to set a theme on this. So the container, the container, um, container is a sysadmin, a sysadmin's way of saying an application, <laughs> all right? There's a Linux container technology uh, that is this way of doing namespaces and C groups and all this sorts of stuff. But really when I'm referring to containers in this talk, I mean thinking about an application as a deployment object instead of a server as a deployment object. Um, 
So that's really what containers are about and why you've seen these, these platforms uh, emerge the way that they're emerging. Because of the switch to thinking about applications first, we're seeing new open source as well as commercial things emerge. That's why all these companies are, are here. Um, and from an application portability perspective, the container also re represents this chance where all of these products, whether it's a hosted you know, cloud offering or an open source tool, we, are, we have a shot at interoperability um, between this application unit, the container running in all of those different environments. Um, so all of these guys represent it, and the first one I'm gonna talk about is Mesosphere. So who here's heard of Mesos? Okay. Mesos is a cluster management tool. Mesosphere is the company behind it. Um, Mesosphere is always used containers as part of their product. Um, the way that Mesos works is they've essentially taken a lot of the concepts from Google around Borg and how you do these distributed system deployments and, and built an open source project around that. Their namesake uh, companies or folks like Twitter or Airbnb use Mesos for running their big production infrastructure. Um, Containers are a component within it. It's the application unit, again, that's being deployed within Mesos. They previously had their own versions of containers, but have since adopted Docker, as well as some of the app container specifications that we're working on. And their commercialization around Mesos is, is the open core model. So Mesos itself is open source. It's an Apache Software Foundation project. Um, and there's a, they have a product called DCOS, which is the open core, sort of enterprise-ready version of it. All right, so that's Mesos. Uh, the next one is Cloud Foundry, also a Linux Foundation and a collaboration project. Um, that is a Heroku-like platform as a service offering. The container in this case is, a, is the, the unit that again gets shipped out and deployed onto the infrastructure. The developer's interface is like a, a Git push uh, for how you actually run, um, you know, r run your infrastructure that way. Um, and their commercialization is also, again, open core. Similar to Mesos, there's some uh, proprietary add-ons that you can buy. That's the enterprise-ready version. The next one I want to talk about was Amazon. Um, Amazon's interesting because, you know, for the most part, um, Amazon is open source libraries and things like this, but they are not an open source company. They are, they are a cloud service provider with source stack. They use a lot of open source. I mean, they're powered heavily by open source, but the products in it themselves are not. Um, what Amazon did was take a container and add it to their, um, they launched a service called EC2 Container Service, which essentially boots an Amazon instance, puts a container on it, and then hooks it up to existing Amazon networking, load balancing, ELBs, you know, all of the Amazon products. Um, their monetization on that, they don't charge for the container service itself. They only charge you for the infrastructure that you, you use as a result of deploying the container. All right, now we have Kubernetes, which is uh, Google's foray into this, Kubernetes is a cluster management system similar to Mesos, but different in design. Uh, what Kubernetes has been doing is, um, I, I think, very similar to, to Rackspace's early strategy with OpenStack, put out a, a open source version of how, how you run cloud infrastructure. In this case, it's how Google runs cloud infrastructure, which is very heavy distributed systems. Um, they are using containers, again, as that application object of portability that's going on. Um, and their commercialization, Kubernetes itself, is completely open source and free. Um, it, it has no clear um, commercialization from Google itself other than incentivizing people to run on Google Cloud. Um, so on Google Cloud, you can use Kubernetes. Uh, just how similar on Rackspace, you could use OpenStack at Rackspace, but you could take OpenStack and use it elsewhere. You can take Kubernetes. It's an Apache 2 licensed project. Um, embed it in your own products or, or just set it up and run your infrastructure. All right, so those are service providers. Now we have Docker themselves. Um, both, both Docker and our company are, are pretty early stage, so the current, current models are subject to change. Um, but Docker uh, originally is a tool for downloading, building, and running a container. Um, their primary modelization model that is in the in market today is a hosted software as a service that you can use for, uh, you know, it's like GitHub, but for containers, so hosting and sharing containers. Um, there has been announcements around on-prem commercial versions of that piece of software, but again, being an early stage startup, this is all quickly emerging, um, and I can't speak too much to it. I'd like to know each of these products I talk about use the Docker container as a portability unit there, um, and that is one of the, I think, great things about Docker is that they have a, a unit that 
they define that container and that idea of a container uh, that can be shared between these hosted or open source proprietary products. And then there's ourselves. Um, so our model is we have a set of open source projects. We have about 100 open source projects on, on GitHub. The three big ones that we talked about are you know, CoreOS, Rocket, and etcd. Um, and then over here on this other side, we have commercial implementations of, of, um, of products that cater to this emerging space. So these are things like tools for helping managing your updates, you know, tools for deploying and distributing your containers, and so on. I um, won't get too into that because I don't want to do the sales pitch. Um, but our model is open source components, no direct commercialization over here, commercial software for enterprises that, that want to buy a solution off the shelf versus piece together the open source themselves. Uh, and that's the model that we will continue to go down and ship there. So the one last here call to action on this is you'll notice each of these different products are using a container and using um, a a interoperable unit, or we all want that. All these vendors agree on it. You know, we have the hosted service providers which aren't doing open source. We have the hosted service providers that are. We have we have these companies that are commercializing open source. But we all agree on, and what we all have a shot at is a unit of portability between both open source and commercial products. Um, and to that end, we we think for this to actually work and to be something that is adopted, we have to write down a specification of what that is. Often the de facto is what gets adopted, but in the case where interoperability is what is important, uh, we think we need to write down a specification of what a container is, what a container runtime is, um, and that's something that we call app container. All of those projects that we looked at have somehow you know, evaluated, contributed, or are currently implementing the app container spec. It's kind of like HTTP for what a container is. This is, this is emerging kind of grassroots effort. You know, we've contributed a lot to it, um, but there's a, a community around it. You know, working with Linux Foundation to think about ways about how we, we neutralize this IP. So again, it becomes something like the HTTP of, of containers. Um, so this is work that's underway, and if you're interested in, in uh, kind of how we can keep all this neutral, but yet create an ecosystem where, where we can build business around this stuff, I think that this is an important place to look. So, in summary, what's really happened with the container is this transition to applications as the default object that are deployed, um, not the server. And if we forget about the server, from our perspective, we can use that to secure the internet. But as we've seen, there's a number of different vendors out there that are, are doing different things with it. Uh, this, is, this change is causing a bunch of different open source and commercial kind of businesses. There's a flurry of ecosystem companies starting to emerge around containers, around storage, around networking around you know, hosted services, kind of all over the place, again, powered by open source. And most importantly, we have a true shot at application interoperability. I'll be able to take my application, run it on my desktop using my open source tool here, but be able to deploy it on Amazon's cloud into their own environment. Um, and that is something all the vendors are agreeing on, is, is something we want as part of this, and it wasn't able to be achieved uh, with virtualization in the kind of the server-focused way, and, and I, think, uh, I think we have a shot at it, and we could use your support uh, making sure that, that that happens. So thank you very much, um, and again, we have a few more talks um, coming the, the rest of this summit about the specific things if you're interested in that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you. Man. Uh, th uh, this is a pretty cool, I mean, I literally get asked about this every single day from members of the Linux Foundation, press, all, all over the place. So I think this, I, I love how you say this is all subject to change because it's such a rapidly moving thing. But uh, the call to create some consistency is also equally important. So look for interesting things uh, in this space. Um, we're a little bit behind. Uh, I think we can take a 15-minute break uh, and come back in here. So uh, why don't we just, if you look at your watches, 15 minutes from now, come on back in. We have more keynotes, uh, and I hope you enjoyed the morning. Thank you.